We move next to a panel discussion, which is, uh, as uh, we call it, a completely new format where we do not have moderation. We leave our amazing speakers and panelists to um, self-moderate and uh, to build the best content possible from their discussion. And here we are, we'll be having an open discussion about climate change, climate action, sustainability. And um, we have Andrew Harper, Cody Sims, and Oprio really like in this wonderful open discussion. Um, Cody is a good friend uh, since he was with Techstars. Cody, let's start with you, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, I'm Cody Sims with MCJ Collective. Uh, excited to have a, a really wonderful chat today uh, as part of Global Impact Week, um, talking all about climate change, climate action, and sustainability, topics that are near and dear to my heart. Um, as a quick introduction, uh, I am a partner at MCJ Collective. Um, MCJ Collective uh, stands for My Climate Journey. Uh, we are, are a, a three-part organization, one part a venture capital fund that invests in early stage climate tech companies, uh, one part media arm that creates the My Climate Journey podcast hosted by my partner, Jason Jacobs, and one part online climate community. We have an active membership of a few thousand people that uh, engage in conversations about climate innovation, uh, climate change, climate policy, and how those worlds come together. Uh, you can learn more about that at uh, myclimatejourney.co. Um, I'm also the co-founder of a, a climate action, uh, political action, uh, nonprofit organization called Climate Changemakers. Uh, at Climate Changemakers, we encourage you to take an hour of action per week uh, to go about pursuing political policy that make a difference in the climate world. Uh, we help coordinate and organize ways to make it really easy for you to build a regular habit around taking climate action. And you can learn more about Climate Changemakers at climatechangemakers.org. Um, briefly, my background before then, um, I spent about the last eight years in early stage uh, venture capital and investing with Techstars, uh, most recently leading Techstars climate and sustainability practice. Um, and then before then, spent about 15 years in mostly consumer internet uh, media and product management. Uh, working at companies like Yahoo and the New York Times and StumbleUpon. So I'm new to the climate world, uh, but have dived in headfirst uh, and am really inspired currently by the intersection of what's going on in technology and innovation, what's going on in uh, work around climate, and how those things also revolve around the policy world. Uh, it's such, a, such an, an, an immersive and overall um, involved space and there's so much incredible energy happening there right now. Um, so that's me in a nutshell, uh, but what we're gonna do is dive in and have a real conversation. Um, and so we've got uh, a, a number of esteemed uh, guests here on the panel uh, and I'm gonna start uh, just diving right into questions. Um, and then I'll ask each panelist as we dive into their question to give an introduction about themselves as well. Um, so let's start with Osprey. Um, Osprey, maybe introduce yourself and the work you're doing at uh, Women's Earth and Climate Action Network International, um, and talk to us a bit about why climate justice matters and what it actually means. Well, it's really an honor to be here with all of you. As you said, my name is Osprey, Osprey Oriel Lake, and I'm with the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. I'm the executive director and the founder. And uh, after a lot of research, um, when we first started the organization, we learned that there is a really powerful nexus between women's leadership and climate solutions. And so we focus on women around the world and their solutions to the climate crisis. <clears throat> and in regard to climate justice, it really means finding solutions to the climate crisis that not only reduce carbon emissions and protect the natural world, but they do so in a way which also generates a just and equitable world in the process. And in fact, we can't really separate social and ecological issues. As an example, while at this point we're all experiencing the impacts of the climate crisis in some manner right now, we're not experiencing them evenly. So climate justice requires us to understand the root causes of interlocking crises 
so that we can dismantle the structures that brought us to this perilous moment in the first place, such as the ideologies of white supremacy, patriarchy, colonization, and endless economic growth models. And we really can't move forward if we continue to see that there's um, you know, communities that are going to be left out, island nations, uh, communities of the global south. Uh, so there's no sacrifice people in, in the plan that we need to go forward with. And it really requires us to invest in systemic change that centers care for the earth's ecological integrity, as well as women, indigenous, black and brown and frontline communities and peoples and voices around the world that have been historically oppressed. Uh, and just to give one quick example, um, it's really through colonization over many years and environmental racism that indigenous peoples are forcibly removed from their lands um, when they in fact are the best stewards of it. 80% of all the biodiversity left on earth is in the lands and hands of indigenous peoples. And this is vital to resolving the climate crisis. So collectively, we really need to stand for indigenous rights and sovereignty so that they can manage their own lands. So in essence, climate justice frameworks really require that climate policies, as you were referring to Cody before, how important climate policy is, it really needs to prioritize social, racial and economic justice and indigenous human rights. And that's how we're gonna really build forward with community solutions that are central to resolving this crisis. That's wonderful. And I've seen some examples where, uh, where in particularly I've seen a few in, in Latin America where um, governments have actually uh, essentially asked indigenous communities to become stewards of the land that they are uh, residing on. And you've seen actually significantly greater amounts of, um, of overall uh, um, land stewardship and, uh, and, and sort of um, prevention of, re of, of deforestation, increase of afforestation, et cetera. Um, so that's incredibly powerful work you're doing. If you have any examples of that you wanna share for folks, I'm sure people would love to hear it. Yeah, there's many, as you said, you know, one of the forests are absolutely key to mitigating the climate crisis because they sequester carbon. And the best way to protect forests as the United Nations study shows and many others is for indigenous people to be ongoing steward of their traditional lands. And there's a lot of conflict around that. And so one of the things that we need to do is ensure that indigenous peoples are in charge of their own lands and territories. So this is a, a very powerful example and um, people can learn more about this. We have a Women for Forest program where women around the world are protecting their forests, but they're also uh, reforesting damaged lands. And it's a very successful way of ensuring that we protect our forests uh, for climate mitigation, but also uh, biodiversity protection. And people can learn more about that um, at our website, which is at wecaninternational.org. That's wonderful. Um, well, thank you. And, and let's go uh, to Andrew. Um, Andrew, maybe you can uh, take a minute and introduce uh, the work you're doing on uh, uh, with Climate Action with uh, the UN Refugee Agency, um, and also talk about um, how climate change is multiplying really the risk for displacement. Um, what is going to happen worldwide in terms of migration and how climate change plays a role in that? Um, you know, I, I've seen a stat uh, before that says somewhere along the lines of, you know, today roughly 1% of the Earth's surface is too hot to live on, like the Sahara Desert. Um, and we may be facing a world over the next 50 years where that could be upwards of 20% of the world's land surface, which is a stat that just breaks my heart. And, uh, and, and frankly, I can't even get my head around what that would mean for all, all of us around the world. Um, but I'm, I really would love to hear your thoughts on this. Okay, thanks, Cody, um, and thanks certainly for the for the invitation to um, to come here. It's um, it's reassuring that um, discussing people who have already been displaced or are in threat of being displaced is um, is being um, moved up on the agenda in terms of, of climate change. What my job is, um, I'm the special advisor to the High Commissioner for Refugees on Climate Action, and why that is important is that. There's already 84 million people who have been displaced from their homes due to conflict. And <clears throat> what we're seeing, and this is, this is getting clearer and clearer by the day, is that those people who, are, who have been displaced and who do not often have the protection of their governments are really in the worst possible position. 
they are already being hammered day in, day out by uh, the impact of, of climate change. So it's not, it's not something that's happening in the future for these populations. These populations have been forced to flee from their homes and where they found safety and refuge is often in very marginal uh, locations. So in deserts or in flood prone deltas or in formal settlements. So the, the impacts that people are expecting on populations in 10 or 20 years time, we're seeing it on a daily basis. Uh, whether it be our refugee camps in South Sudan, uh, which have suffered three years of, of flooding, uh, to populations in uh, the Middle East or in the Sahel, um, day in, day out, we're, we're already having to deal with um, this, this situation. So it's, it's a challenging issue when you start talking about climate and displacement because it's not such a clear cut um, nexus there. Um, because, and this is where we need to be much more sophisticated in our, in our analysis. We need to be able to understand that climate change is happening it is, it is happening everywhere in the world, but it's impacting different populations at different um, levels. And those people who have already been displaced or the host communities who are often very poor, um, as uh, was mentioned before, indigenous populations, marginalized groups, they're often the ones who will have to suffer even more than populations that can adapt. And when we talk about climate justice, we also talk about the fact that those populations, particularly in the South, who have contributed the least to global warming are the ones who are being impacted the most. So if you look at, for instance, um, what the OECD uh, has pumped out and what their contribution is to global warming, it's around 80%. Um, however, what Africa as a whole has contributed is two to 3%, but their populations are the ones who are, who are being um, suffering. So where it comes in terms of displacement, we're trying to, to figure out what will climate change um, impact on different areas? So what will be the situation of food insecurity? So even last year, we saw tens of millions more people made uh, food insecure. In as far as access to water, we're either getting too little or too much. But what we are seeing is a concentration of seasons. So we're seeing much more heavy downpours, but this is not supporting crop cycles. So access to water is going to be an issue. Uh, food and security is going to become an increasing issue. Uh, logistics to get supplies to our refugee settlements, and we've got 450 of them around the world, is, is going to become more challenging. Where people had fled from is also going to change. You mentioned, Cody, the fact that you've got um, these heat stress situations. Uh, you, we, we saw it in, in North America last year. We saw it in France a few years ago, where hundreds of people died because of these heat domes this is going to become much more prevalent. So if you've got hundreds, if not thousands of people dying in developed countries, what's it going to be like in, a, in places like Karachi or Lagos or Nairobi or these other areas? So these elements are going to lead to increased tension, um, inability of governments to provide support and services. And each one of these indicators, if governments do not provide education and health due to the fact that they're, they're having to deal with responding to emergencies means that the social contract breaks down. This then leads opportunities for other groups to come to the fore. And so across the board, we're looking at this, this spectrum of, of what causes people to move. And the people moving due to climate change in Afghanistan, the end result for why they move may not necessarily be directly linked to climate change, but it is linked. And the same with people in the South Pacific and elsewhere. I would, um, urge caution when people talk about statistics because how many people move in the future is completely dependent on what we do now. If we have another failed COP, like we've had 26 COPs and we're still in this situation, like how many more COPs before we actually start doing something serious? So the numbers who, of people who will be displaced and who will have to move in order to adapt um, is dependent on, on us. Also, land degradation and biodiversity loss are also elements which we need to very much take into account. And also, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up now, but also you've got a situation about how this interlinks with mega trends, urbanisation, livelihoods, access to everything from internet. Um, so very complex, um, but we're trying to get a better handle on it all. Over. 
Yeah, th thank you, Andrew. And, and, and a follow-up question I have for you is the, the term uh, climate refugee uh -huh. uh, is, has been gaining a lot of um, attention in the media. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see more um, mainstream reports sort of looking at this trend. Um, and, and yet uh, the, the 1951 mm -hmm. uh, Refugee Convention um, doesn't make provisions for people displaced by climate change. Climate change wasn't even something anyone was thinking about in 1951. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if people are having to move beyond their borders for climate reasons, which, as you just discussed, can be incredibly broad from food security to water scarcity to um, heat displacement to political instability caused by these things as underlying factors. Um, what protections are there for people? Well, probably not enough when it comes down to it. Like the, I think we can all agree that anyone who has to cross an international frontier due to reasons which they've got no control over, whether it be conflict or climate, they deserve protection. So I think what people are getting, getting focused very much on the climate refugee element, and I'm not going to say don't use it because in many aspects it does sort of um, evoke the importance of providing protection to people who have been forced to move across the border. But probably the 951 Convention is not the most useful instrument for it. There's other instruments out there uh, which we can be looking at, human rights conventions, regional instruments. Um, the Americas have got the Cartagena um, Declaration. The, the Africa, Africa's got the Organization African Union, Kampala Declaration. Um, the South Pacific Islands have also got um, mechanisms in order to provide protection for people fleeing from disasters. But is there a, an international norm? No. Should there be? It's up to states. Like as soon as you start looking for expansion or extensions of international instruments, particularly protection instruments, you do run into trouble. But what we need to focus on is that the, the vast majority of people who move because of disasters, both slow and, and sudden onset, they don't move across international borders until such time that they find that there's no other option. What we're saying is give them that option. So we cannot continue to ignore that vulnerable communities are going to be hit time and time again. And they need to be supported with resilience um, and support for adaptation. Because if you, if you look at the, um, the, the situation across the board, as far as displacement is concerned, three times as many people have been displaced due to climate change. Sorry, so extreme weather events, I should say, rather than conflict. So the 51 Convention largely deals with conflict and persecution, but what the world is facing at the moment is this huge like, vulnerability multiplier through climate change. And in some contexts, that vulnerability multiplier is causing conflict. And so if people have to flee due to um, a breakdown in law and order, due to this competition and there's conflict persecution, it's not to say that they won't be covered by the 951 Convention, but it's a, it's a... This is what makes lawyers get paid. <laughs> I, think, I think what we've got to say is people who are vulnerable are going to be more vulnerable. And the other element too is that the vast majority of people who are most vulnerable don't have the capacity to move. It's the, the poorest of the poor generally are stuck. It's called immobility. Whereas it's the middle class and others who generally can take the migration route, route or have got other access. The other element with refugees and this is where we've had discussions with South Pacific Islands, is that the governments are saying, look, don't call these people refugees. We're doing whatever we God can do to protect our populations. We're not forcing them to leave. We're trying to protect them. It's just the developed states. It's the, 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 the states that are pumping out carbon dioxide, um, which are making it impossible for us to provide protection for our populations. So... Refugees can give sort of a, an indication that governments are not trying to do whatever they can. But in this instance, most governments are trying to do whatever they can, but the situation is just overwhelming them. They're fascinating. I mean, I, I, I think back to what, uh, what Osprey was saying about, you know, uh, a world that's sort of still uh, dealing with the repercussions of colonialism and whatnot. And, you know, much of the conflict that, uh, the 1951 convention Shirley was dealing with was this sort of post-colonialism, post-colonial unraveling um, of, of sort of the new world order post-World War II. 
um, in which case, uh, you know, conflict was a symptom, not a cause of uh, a lot of these refugee issues. And it sounds like, you know, today with with climate, it's the same sort of thing where, um, you know, conflict actually may be a symptom where where the uh, the actual uh, cause is is obviously, you know, everything that's changing in the world around us, which also is a symptom of this, yeah. you know, previous colonial, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, world order that has 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 the world has been living under for a few hundred years now. Cody, I'll, gi- I'll give you an example. I was just recently in Mauritania dealing with Mal- Malian refugees coming across the border. They've like the concept of an international border means very little to pastoralists, like and herders, like people will move according to the the pastures and to the um, to where the herds can go and where the water is available. And so you, you're completely right. Like there is there is climate change, much like COVID, does not respect international borders. And so you need to be people centric. You need to see okay what. What is it that these populations who are going to be made increasingly vulnerable in the future, if they're not already vulnerable now, will need to survive? And having these free movement provisions is going to be particularly important at, at a regional level. And this is where Africa can demonstrate sort of like progress light years ahead of many others, as can the South Pacific Islands, that they look at this very much sense of community and community protection, which is not just state centric. Over. That's great. Well, I, I want to switch topics a little bit um, and, and talk about some of the ways that uh, the, the, the world that we're seeing today actually is starting to be transformed through science to hopefully help um, mitigate some of these issues that we're all dealing with. Um, Dr. Graciela Chichelnitsky, um, you're the, the co-founder and CEO at Global Thermostats, um, and you're dedicated to fighting climate change by transforming carbon dioxide um, I'd love to hear you introduce a bit about yourself and your work and, and sort of what outcomes you're hoping to achieve with the work you're doing. Thank you, Cody. Um, my name is Graciela Gijelniski. I am the founder, co-founder and CEO of Global Thermostat, a company that has a unique breakthrough technology that um, removes CO2 directly from air and allows that to be used for the production of goods and services, therefore produ- producing, not undermining economic welfare. For example, CO2 removed from air can be used to produce clean gasoline from water and air. Um, for example, beverages and foods produced from the use of CO2, fuels, as I mentioned before, um, gasoline, etc. And on the whole, there is a trillion dollar market for CO2 this uh, decade that can be exploited. So you have to, we have to start thinking of CO2 as the new petroleum for economic development, and it has the advantage that there is a lot of it, and it's free in the sense when it comes from the air, except for the cost of extraction. The technology is very new, but as Corey Cody pointed out, the problem is not. And the problem is a direct consequence of colonialism, as Cody uh, mentioned. Colonialism, as you know, was, uh, among other things, racism, but also a direct theft by the rich nations of uh, poor nations that had limited property rights. And some of them still have very limited property rights for their own resources. Think of the Amazon. There are no property rights on that incredibly valuable uh, piece of the earth. Um, those resources. But that's also true for extractive resources. And the situation of Africa is closely connected to uh, the lack of property rights, which is a stage of development, local property rights, leading to over extraction of the resources because they are considered free or they are extracted without payment, 
and they are exported uh, in a subsidized manner. So they are exported by the poor nations to their detriment at low cost, low prices, to the rich nations who in turn overconsume them. This is the problem of colonialism that was exacerbated by international trade when colonialism ended or supposedly ended in the 1950s. And it is of course, as you know very well, directly connected with the problems of racism that worry all of us and are very present in all societies, particularly the most advanced societies, I may say. So to make a long story short, that's the problem. We are trying to survive the consequences of a most unfair, inequitable, exploitative, on a global scale system that humankind, and in fact, most animal societies have ever seen the consequences that I just mentioned of colonialism. But in that process, we can't seem to be able to change the structure sufficiently fast. And therefore, it becomes critical to use science for the purpose of directly getting rid of the problem, the overconsumption of fossil fuels in industrial society by the rich nations, by the rich nations, not by the poor, okay, by the rich. That overconsumption now has resulted in excess of CO2 in the atmosphere because when you consume uh, gasoline, when you consume petroleum, natural gas, etc., what happens is you emit CO2. That CO2 is causing climate change. That can be then looked at scientifically. So you say, are you going to get science to resolve an inequity problem? No, not possible. But in the short run, we may be able to grab that CO2. And as a matter of fact, if we don't do it, there is no solution for climate change. The inter intergovernmental panel of climate change, which is a scientific authority in the world on this issue, um, has it part of the United Nations, IPCC, uh, has documented, and so has the United States Academy of Sciences and the corresponding body self everywhere, that unless we remove approximately 100 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere by the end of the century, there is no way to prevent the worst catastrophic climate change that we all fear. Some of which is already happening, but now we're talking at a different scale that directly threatens human civilization and the survival of our species to the extent that it is connected to the civilization that we all more or less share. That is a scientific problem, the removal of CO2. Then we can use it for economic purposes, as I mentioned before. That's what this company does, our company, Global Thermostat. How does it do it? They are well-known technologies for removing gases selectively. For example, nitrogen from air, removing it. In this case, it's CO2 that is already in the atmosphere, also known as legacy CO2, has to be physically removed and then stabilized on Earth as opposing the atmosphere. Why is the CO2 in the atmosphere so destructive, it behaves like a blanket. And so the heat keeps from the sun, keeps coming in, but it can't leave because of the blanket, the CO2. So the opacity of the atmosphere caused by CO2 is the direct immediate cause of climate change, which is one of the many, but the worst environmental problems that have to do with the overuse of natural resources, which are over extracted in the poor nations and over exported at low prices to the rich nations. That's the problem in a nutshell. Science can deal with that. 
The problem is the time is very short and that's what we're working with. So we are in a very constrained situation. We need to achieve in the next 10 or 20 years, the removal of 40 gigaton or so, 30, 40 gigaton of CO2, that is legacy CO2 is in the atmosphere. We have technologies to do that. And the technology of global thermostat has been recently validated by the MIT Technology Review um, Award as the top 10 breakthrough technologies in the world and curated by Bill Gates to demonstrate that it has validity even at the business, in the business sense. And Cody must know because of course, Cody is uh, involved in an investment fund. So he has to worry about these things all the time. So he may not know exactly the details of what I'm saying. He certainly knows the problem and he certainly knows what we should be doing. I just wanted to say, this is absolutely an emergency. And whether we do it or not, uh, we have to come to a conclusion. It will come to a conclusion naturally in the next 10, 20 years. So I'm willing to answer questions. We uh, have several plants that we have deployed. Uh, some of them in Silicon Valley, Stanford Research Institute that worked very well for several years the cost being higher than we wanted. So we built another one that is now built for Siemens with the cooperation of uh, Latin American investors from AME and um, also cooperation with Exxon, believe it or not, since Exxon, as you probably know, is responsible for in great part for the fossil fuel emissions uh, connection. Whether they like it or not, I think they don't like it, but this is the reality. They're working, we're working with them, they're excellent scientists for the chemical purposes. So this technology is mechanical and chemical. And with this technology, you can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. I am right now adding to the technology an informational blockchain aspect to make it easier to deploy and adapted to a new type of market, which is not the carbon market that I originated, I designed, and I even wrote into the Kyoto Protocol, 1997, which became international law in 2005, and which succeeded in removing, or decreasing, I should say, the emissions below the original level of 2005 by 20% in the year 2020, very successful within the European Union emission trading system. Not enough, even though it's acknowledged that it's the most successful mechanism for humans, the carbon market so far to decrease emissions. Now we have to remove physically the CO2 that is already there. It's not just to limit emissions, it's to physically remove what's already there. So that process, uh, requires, in my view, the creation of a new type of market, which is not the carbon market that we already created and succeeded with, and I'm very pleased for that, but for the carbon removal market, not to not credits on reducing emissions, credits on removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere. That market is something I'm working with, with people from the European uh, Union Emission Trading System, which is the granddaddy of all carbon markets in the world and very successful at that. So I hope I gave you a whole panorama. Please ask me any questions if you have any. And, uh, and yes, and good luck to all of us because we need a solution and fast, fast. Thank you, Dr. Cicilinski. Uh, great to hear an overview of your work. And um, you know, you're right. As a as an uh, an, an investor in early stage climate technologies, um, we are investing both in 
uh, carbon removal technologies, uh, startups and other organizations that are extracting carbon dioxide from the air, as well as uh, decarbonization technologies. So companies that are helping um, either to decarbonize our energy systems or decarbonize our industrial systems uh, to, to change how those functions operate today. A really good metaphor I heard um, recently was if you have a swimming pool and it's, and it's getting filled with dirty water, um, A, you need to stop putting dirty water in the pool. Um, but then B, you need to remove the dirty water from the pool as well. And, yes. you know, that's the only way to have a, a viable swimming pool in the future. Um, both, and I think, both, uh, both. yeah, you have to do both. Now, I think the, you know, the knock on um, CDR is, you know, some people saying it's only a crutch for the fossil fuel industry to help them continue to emit. Um, I think the reality of it is, if you look at our carbon budget, where there's um, something like 400 gigatons of CO2 that is all we have left to emit between now and the next 10 years, now in 2030. Um, and we're currently as a, as a global population emitting, you know, roughly 50 uh, gigatons of CO2 a year. There's no question that try as we might, as, as hard as we might to decarbonize as fast as we can. Um, there is other work that needs to get done to remove all of this uh, from the atmosphere that's already there uh, to, because CO2 stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Um, so, so thanks. I, I appreciate your perspective. I know, Osprey, you had a question and wanted to weigh in. So why don't, why don't you jump in and would love to hear uh, your, your thoughts or questions you have as well. Yeah, um, I think that uh, it's really important just to, to bring forward a couple of comments here. Because we are in a global climate crisis, I, we can't emphasize enough the urgency that we're in. I mean, this is a life and death situation and it really is an all hands on deck moment. And to the point around the issue of uh, stopping digging the hole that we're in, I think it's really important to realize that when we look at the fossil fuel industry, they do not have plans to phase out. And so we're putting more and more fossil fuels into the atmosphere as we speak. And the level at which the major oil companies, the fossil fuel companies are looking at phasing out is nowhere near what science demands. This is also true of the um, financial institutions. 60 of the largest banks in the world have collectively financed $3.8 trillion in fossil fuel companies since the Paris Agreement. Since the Paris Agreement, when we all decided that we are going to work towards 1.5 degrees of global warming, $3.8 trillion has been fed into the fossil fuel companies. And the recent report by the UN Environment Program found that governments, governments still plan to, to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than what would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. So, you know, how can we possibly navigate the climate crisis with these literally impossible numbers when you look at it from a physics position? So I think we have to also come back around to, you know, where are the government leaders willing to stand up to the fossil fuel industry? Because we know there's a revolving door between the, the government leaders and, and, and the fossil fuel companies. So I think that we have to get very real that we're talking about a deep systemic change. And this is why earlier I was talking about climate justice, because if we look at the history of colonization, the history of capitalism, the history of environmental racism, and the fact that we look at certain areas and say, these areas we can extract from, and there can be sacrificed people, sacrificed zones, people that are expendable, lands that are expendable, why the wealthy, and those in power continue in the same modality that we're in, it's going to take all of us off the cliff, but impacting those first and worst that were referred to earlier that are being pushed into migrations that are vulnerable communities. So I think that we have a crisis at a social level that we have to deal with. And the lack of power that we see and impetus of ambition from governments is something that has to be addressed. And the other point I wanted to make, you know, speaking of the COP earlier, because we go to the climate negotiations every year at our organization and lift up women's leadership, lift up 
Indigenous leaders, lift up Black and Brown communities. People have very different worldview of how we should move forward um, and not through market-based mechanisms that are actually part of the same capitalistic system that got us into this crisis in the first place. We have to be very careful of not seeing that we're going to buy our way out and continue business as usual because business as usual is what got us into this climate crisis. So the last thing I wanted to say is that every year we hear at the climate talks that the wealthy countries are going to contribute $100 billion a year promised from the wealthy countries so that we can move towards a just transition. But where is that $100 billion? We seem to be able to put it into the military and many other places, but where is that $100 billion for the vulnerable communities so that we can look at these transitions in a different in a different way. So I just wanted to add in that I think this problem is much more complex than looking at business as usual and looking at economics in the same way that we have been and seeing how we also need to look back to nature, look back to the natural systems, look back to how we're going to protect the last of the clean water, the last of our forests, and who's actually doing that work to ensure that we continue to maintain ecological integrity and protect frontline communities. For so, sure. Osprey, thank you it. so much for your comments. I have to say, I really agree with them. I agree with each one of them. And I hope I didn't give the impression that I didn't. The only thing is that to what you say, which is true and fair, we have to add an answer to the following question. What do we do now? And that is what Global Thermostat was created and the technology that we did with Peter Eisenberger was created for. In other words, it's not business as usual, not at all. It is business as not usual. And the question that we are trying to answer is, what can we do now? I don't just want to complain, although we should complain, and talk about change, although we should talk about change, and everything that you say is true, but we have to do something about it or else we are toast. I don't know if uh, this expression <laughs> makes yeah. sense. I, I, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm, I completely agree with you. I'm just saying, I think that there's a lot of solutions that frontline communities are offering about circular economies, agroecology, uh, community gardens. There's beautiful solutions, a plethora of solutions, indigenous rights that we have that also are part of the solution. I agree. We need to be talking about solutions. And I'm just presenting that there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. That's all. So here is what I missed uh, to communicate, for which I apologize. No, we don't have a lot of solutions. According to the IPCC, and they are the Global Scientific Authority, even according to the National Academy of Sciences of the US, which is the nation that historically has caused this problem more than any together with Europe. What we need to do, what we must do, what is the only possible thing to do that can solve this problem? Listen to what I'm saying is remove CO2 that is already in the atmosphere. So it's not that you're wrong, not at all. And trees are wonderful. They are not enough. Not if we plant a tree on every square yard in the, plant, in the planet, by the end of the century, the United Nations showed we will be removing 10% of what we are emitting. So this is not the solution. The trees are essential for human survival and for biodiversity. They cannot solve this problem. The only thing that can solve this problem now is to remove the excess CO2 from the atmosphere, which is what science can help do. And it's difficult and it must be done, must be done urgently, must be done with all hands on deck. And yes, the private sector can help, Yes, science can help, innovation is critical, equity is critical in this context, and we have to both restrain emissions, just like Coy said, and remove what's already there. Uh, so it seems like an almost impossible phenomenon, and I wish we had more time, but we don't. Yeah. So, Discuss so about how this can be achieved. 
So, you know, to conclude us up, I, I've I've long been advocating that, you know, A, I don't think there's one silver bullet to climate change, but I think there are three things that every individual can get involved in. One is money. So looking at where your money is and looking at how you are contributing uh, to help or hurt this the situation by where your money is invested, what banks you use, what uh, underlying assets you have respond you have exposure to through different investment vehicles you have, and if you want to get really extreme with it, uh, right now I would say the soul of money is under uh, under fire with some of what's going on in the cryptocurrency space and decentralization, where for the first time there are experiments happening with money that is not backed by essentially government military power, um, which is a fascinating way to think about what's happening for the soul of money. So money is one thing, looking at where your money is and, and what it stands for. Two is power. So how can you get involved? How can we all get involved in advocating for political change and for holding politicians accountable? Um, that's again, what we focus on at Climate Change Makers is pushing for political power and political action that um, aligns with the urgency of the crisis at need. And the third, and I'm hearing a lot from you, Aspria, that this is an organ. This is something your organization does, is around storytelling, right? How do we collectively help the world understand where we all might be going from a "what if this all works" perspective? Because what we've heard about climate for the last thirty years is the horrible gloom and doom of what's actually happening today. That's helped open some people's eyes, not enough eyes, but some people's eyes to the problem. Um, but people generally, humans generally aren't motivated by badness, right? Dr. Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a problem. He said, I have a dream. And he helped motivate people about what could be. And one, I think, thing that's missing in the climate space is the storytelling component of what if all this works? What if we do decarbonize our energy sector? What if we do uh, figure out how to have full electric mobility? What if we do have regenerative agriculture um, as our method of generating food for the soon to be 10 billion people on this planet? Um, what if we do figure out how money and power and military and energy aren't necessarily intrinsically linked together? Um, what does that world look like? And how can we all aim for that in terms of what it means to thrive both as humans and as life on earth in general, including all the biodiversity that's underlying it? Um, so I think with that, that's a, it's been a, a, a fascinating and wonderful conversation today. Um, I think we're at time and I really want to thank each of you for joining us and want to thank uh, Global Impact Week for hosting this uh, discussion today.